Does it say it's recording? It, it does. All right, good. <clears throat> well, in the past few weeks, uh, for identification purposes, this is the Georgia School of Preaching, I believe week number four or five, <laughs> I always lose count, of Genesis class 2019. In the past few weeks, we have been um, talking about God as our creator, and we looked at the film for a couple of weeks that <clears throat> showed great evidence that uh, the world in which we live is not the result of some cosmic accident or billions of years of mindless, uh, designless evolution, just random chance happenings. There's too much design in the universe for too much evidence of it for there, this to have been a giant freak uh, accident of uh, nature. And the teaching of this class is that God is our creator and creation took place just as is recorded in uh, Genesis chapters one and two. In this class, based on the evidences of scripture, uh, we reject the uh, paradigm of evolution, the current, or not the current, well, the current one, but also, also the well-accepted paradigm of, of evolution, because we believe that God is our creator. Now, we haven't gotten to chapter three of Genesis, and uh, it'll be a little bit before we get there, because I'm a little slow, but you know what it says. You've read Genesis chapter three before, so based on your knowledge, Lawrence, of Genesis chapter three, what exists in Genesis chapter three that did not exist in chapter two, or more specifically, in the creation week? In Genesis chapter one and two, God creates and he finishes his creation. Is there something that exists in chapter three that did not exist in chapters one and two. Man. Well, no, man did exist because he's created on day six. Six, okay, yeah. Of the creation week, and the, the creation week has ended as of uh, Genesis chapter two. In Genesis chapter three, we don't know how long, how far uh, time-wise uh, Genesis chapter two is from Genesis chapter three. It may be the next day. It may be the next year. It may be 10 years. Uh, <clears throat> we don't know. It's probably not a long time. Um, uh, but we don't know. Uh, we can't really speculate as to how long, what distance of time or what amount of time is between Genesis chapter uh, 2 and 3. But the question is, uh, is there something new in chapter three that was not created by God in chapters one and two. Well, we didn't hear about the serpent, I think, until chapter three. That's true, not specifically. However, he is a land creature. Yes. I don't know if he, how he got about uh, before the curse of Genesis chapter three. Uh, but he did, he was created, the serpent was created in chapter uh, one on day six. He would have been a land creature, so he would have been created as the same day man was. So he's not new to the creation. He's specifically named in chapter three, but he's not new to the creation. Any other ideas? Um. There clothing, is clothing because of the fig tree was in chapter three. The, the fig right. tree was there, but clothing was not developed until chapter three. That is correct. Uh, clothing uh, was made either by the fig tree or from the fig tree or from an animal skin. Uh, but that's not a creation in the sense of uh, something that was created from nothing. God used something that was already there. 
or yeah. Adam and Eve did to, to do that. Um, we know uh, one thing that's not uh, in chapters two and three, and this is, uh, or I'm sorry, chapters one and two, and you know this, you're just not thinking about it, is sin. Oh, yeah. Sin, it did not exist in chapter two. Think about that for a moment how that the world God created is without sin. You and I would not recognize it for, uh, because all we can see in our experience uh, is are, are things that have been affected by uh, sin one way or another, or by the curse that came as a result of uh, sin. The world we live in is not the same world in a lot of ways, it still has dirt and it still has trees and mountains and so forth, but there's a lot of things that would be different in our world today that you know, they just weren't there in chapters one and two because the curse came in chapter uh, three as a result of sin and sin or, and that curse changed the world. God did not uh, create sin. We know from reading the chapter that it was Adam and Eve who created uh, sin. We're going to talk about that when we get to it in chapter three. We're not here to discuss tonight chapter uh, three, but I do want to, while we're still within the sphere of the creation week, I want to talk about uh, something else th uh, that was created or maybe not. Uh, and we'll try to discern this as uh, we study through this uh, tonight. There is an existence in chapter three that we have not seen, seen before. It's associated with sin, not actually stated, but it's there. And I want to talk about it. It's evil. Um, I want you to look at the screen. Um, there's a guy about 300 years before Jesus, his name was Epicurus, or Epicurus, uh, the Greek philosopher, the Epicurean doctrine or philosophy comes from this gentleman. He believed, for example, that uh, death <clears throat> is the end of both body and soul. After death, there's nothing. You have nothing to fear at death because there's nothing beyond death. You're just dead, like when you kill a deer or run over a dog, that dog is done. There's nothing, there's no pain after death. There's no torment. There's no anything after death. That's his belief. Uh, he was a philosopher and a lot of people did buy into it and a lot of people do buy into it. Something else he said, it's on the screen there for you and I want you to consider what he said. He said, "If or is God willing to prevent evil, but not able. Then he is not, om not omnipotent. If he's willing, but not able to prevent evil, God is not omnipotent. You know what omnipotent means? He's not all powerful. Omni means all potent, means powerful. Omnipotent means all powerful. If God is willing to prevent evil, but he cannot prevent evil, Epicurus says he's not omnipotent. If he is able, powerful enough to control evil, but he's not willing to control evil, then he is malevolent, which means, I guess, uncaring. He doesn't care about you. He's, uh, well, uncaring. If he is able, powerful enough, and willing, then where does evil come from? If he can stop evil and is willing to stop evil, if he is omnipotent and if he's not malevolent, then where does evil come from? Is he neither able nor willing? Then Epicurus asked the question, why call him God? If God is able to stop 
evil uh, and does not, what kind of God is that? If he's not able to stop uh, evil or is unable to, uh, not willing to stop evil, then why would we call him God? Who is, the, if he has no power nor care, who is he? So what do you think about that statement? I know it's uh, kind of wordy, but what's your first thought when you read that? That's man. That's man's way of thinking, right? It's a worldly way of thinking, very worldly way of thinking, a very um, fleshly way of uh, thinking, and a uh, idea that, or the concept that, you know, like you said, uh, there's nothing beyond death. He has no fear of God because there is no God. He has no reverence for God because there is no God. If there is no God, I'll not be judged for my actions. So I'm not concerned about what happens to me after death because nothing's going to happen to me after death. What do you think, reading this statement, uh, what do you think atheists would think about this statement? I think that's something they will buy in to, but also I think that's what Satan wants people to believe. That's one of his tools, deception. So it, it ties in with Satan. I think you're exactly right. Uh, this is a tool of Satan. And as it is a tool of, of uh, Satan, atheists buy into it. I, atheists want to get rid of God because atheists don't want to be judged by God. So to do that, you got to get rid of God. Now, there are some people, and I've talked about this, I think, that are atheists because that's just what they're taught. They don't, they're not taught any, uh, they don't go to church, they've never been to church, their parents didn't bring them up to be Christians or God-fearing, and so their environment, their social environment, their family environment just taught them not to believe in God. Some of those people are reachable because we can show them that there is a God, but there are others, and I think the majority who don't want to believe in God. These are the people that Paul talks about in Romans chapter one. They have denied in their heart that there is a God. They don't want to believe in God. They want to live like hell, so to speak, and not be judged for it. And so they don't want to believe in God. That's the atheist about whom I speak. And um, I found this on the internet, I was looking for a fray or for a quotation of Epicurus's uh, doctrine, and then looking for it, I found this. And this guy's exactly this guy approaches it like you would think an atheist would. He says he got it. That is Epicurus got it two thousand three hundred years ago. Why can't we get it today? In other words, Epicurus is denying with this philosophy that there is a God. Uh, he the evil and pain and suffering exist, if it exists and God allows it, then he's not God. He's not good. He's not God. So there is no God to control evil, pain, and suffering. And so as a mantra, I would think that atheists would grab a hold of this and, and, and keep it. And they do. This guy is evidence uh, of that. So the immediate question at least in my mind before us, based upon the information that we find in Genesis chapter two, uh, is God the creator of all? Did God create all that has been created? And if he has, if God is the creator of everything and evil exists, then did God create evil? Or to put it in the form of a statement, since God created everything and since evil is a part of that everything, evil exists, God created evil. True or false? Or, I want to say false. Okay. Tell me your thoughts. The reason I say that is because God gave us free will. And even in the creation with Adam and Eve, he had gave instructions. He told Adam not to eat of this truth, of this fruit. And so Adam knew that, Eve knew that. Now, when when the serpent alone, he had Eve by herself. So 
he deceived her by telling her you will surely not die. But God didn't you would not die physically, it was spiritually. Uh -huh. So when she bit of the apple, she she disobeyed God, and that's what sin came from from the disobedience. Okay. We're going to talk more about that uh, when we actually get over to chapter three. Again, this is not a discussion of chapter three, but because this, you know, like I said, we're still within the creation week, and we want to talk about where did evil come from? Did God create it? And we're not introduced to, to evil until you get to chapter three, but I wanted to bring it up in this context for just because we're still in the creation week, and let's talk about it. And you're right in your uh, statement that we are given free will, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit uh, tonight. I want to talk to you about what uh, uh, part Eve and Adam played in the sin, but I'm not, I don't think we're going to get in that tonight. I, want to, I may save that to when we actually get into chapter three. It's very important. Uh, we may discuss it tonight. I'm not sure if uh, it'll work out that way or not. When you think of, Lawrence, when you think of evil, what, um, what definitions, what words, what ideas or concepts come to your mind? I think it's, um, well, I wanted to go back to the uh, uh, disobedient or, um, or, or I would say, um, evil is anything that's against what is good. Right. Um, because when the serpent beguiled Eve, the serpent, was, his intentions was already a bad intention uh, prior to. So it wasn't a good intention. That's right. Uh, so um, th that going against God's will is evil. And we'll, we'll notice where the scriptures actually uh, say that. That's a good point. Can you, um, most of us, when we think of evil, we think of evil deeds, murder, stealing, rape, you know, things like that, evil deeds. And that's, it's appropriate to think in that way. But can it be said that um, evil is a living thing? Evil has a personality. It has an existence. Is it, yes. just, is it just bad things that people do, or does it have a, uh, for lack of better words, does it have a presence in this world? Um, it does. That's right. And I want us to see that. I want us to see that defined in Scripture. I think it's important as we discuss this that we do that. Um, when you think of um, the power of evil, when we use that term, the power of evil, it says evil has power. If it's just an object, if it's just a non-entity, then it has no power. A rock has no power. The only power the rock has is the power I give it when I throw it, right? So mm -hmm. evil, if it has power, it tells me that it's it has a presence. I won't say it's a uh, a being in that sense, like I'm a human being, and God is a divine being. I don't know what word I could use to describe evil in that sense, but because it can have power and does have power, then it tells me it, it is an entity of some sort. It can possess things. It can do things. We think of the term, the biblical term, the kingdom of darkness. Darkness there is a synonym for evil. It's the kingdom which belongs to evil or the kingdom which belongs to, to darkness. Evil or darkness has a kingdom. It has a presence. It has power. And I want us to see that, not just from my saying it, but I want us to see it in a few scriptures. Look with me, and they'll be on the screen. Luke chapter 22, verse 52. Listen to what he says. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, have you come against have you come out against a, a robber with swords and clubs? This is when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane 
and they were going to arrest him. He says, I was with you daily in the temple and you did not seize me. But he says, this is your hour and the power or the ability of darkness. This is the hour that belongs to the power or to the ability of darkness. Jesus acknowledges that there's something about evil or darkness that has some kind of uh, presence about it because it has the ability to possess time, in this case, or possess power. The power of darkness is, is obviously something that evil has the ability to possess. And then there's another passage, Luke, or I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, where Paul writes, Christ has, or God has, delivered us from the what? The power which belongs to darkness, and he has conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, or the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through the, his blood, the forgiveness of sins. If I am delivered from something, it means I was a captive of that thing, right? If I'm delivered, delivered from slavery, I was a captive of someone, and I was their slave. Well, here Paul says, I am delivered from something and conveyed into something else. Well, what is that something from which I was delivered? Well, it's evil. I was a captive of the power, the, uh, the, the, the ability, uh, the strength of, of evil, and I was taken from that and delivered into the kingdom of of uh, God's Son. Something is alive. How you would define that or describe that, I don't know. I'm not sure if I can myself, but it's sufficient to say that it's alive, that it has power to make me captive. Another passage found in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul writes, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Well, we know the devil's alive, for we do not wrestle <clears throat> against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, <clears throat> against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. That word rulers in the Greek, um, it's... Uh, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, but cosmocrator. It's two words joined together. The word cosmos is the word that's usually used to describe this world. Uh, uh, cosmopolitan, you're familiar with that term. Um, cosmos is a word that means a, uh, an organized system. And in most cases, or in a lot of cases in the, in the New Testament, it is a reference to the world in which we live, the created uh, world. So the word ruler is the word cosmos, crator. The word crator is something, uh, is someone who by his hand has seized something, by his strength has seized something. So the cosmocrator, the ruler, is someone who has seized the world by his power, okay? Maybe I'm getting too technical here, but I want you to see something. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness. Um, a spiritual host of uh, wickedness. If we, we were to study the book of Ephesians together, we would talk about this heavenly places uh, there in chapter or verse uh, 12, it's mentioned five times in the book of Ephesians. It's the only place in the Bible that the heavenly places is uh, mentioned. And these rulers of darkness are there in these, whatever the heavenly places are, they're there. But I want you to see, and I'm not going to try to get off in that discussion, but what I want you to see is these are beings. <clears throat> these are uh, things that are uh, alive, they are, it's synonymous with evil, the same evil that we find in Genesis chapter uh, 3, and they are in existence. Uh, they came into being somehow, and that's what I want to discuss tonight. 
Another passage found in 1 John chapter 2, it says, Again, a new commandment I write to you, which things uh, or thing is true in him, because the darkness, there's that word darkness again, is passing away, and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates the, his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness, walks in darkness, does not know where he's going because the darkness has done something. The darkness has blinded his eyes. That word darkness there, I think, is synonymous with evil. And what I want you to see, I know I'm repeating myself, but I want you to see it. It's doing something. It has the power to do something. It has the power to take captive. It has the power to, uh, in this case, blind someone's eyes. Jesus said back what we, we read in uh, Luke, where it possesses time. It has an hour, so to speak. Uh, there's something about this darkness, this evil that um, it's alive. And I want us to, to see that and understand something about it when we do see that. First John 5 verse 18, we know not, or we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The word wicked one there it means it's a Greek word which means uh, harmful or uh, harmful influence. He, we, uh, we are under the sway of a harmful or wicked influence. That word one, wicked one, it makes us think of Satan, but I don't know that Satan was the intent of the idea there. Satan is the subject of um, uh, He, he, he is the, the wicked one, I suppose. Or, well, I know that he is the wicked one, but in the Greek wording of this word, it's not specifically referring to a person, but a, a presence. Uh, or it's, I don't think it's a reference to Satan himself, although he is included in it, but it's talking about a wicked or hurtful influence. God, uh, the person who murders his brother, is under a hurtful influence influence. What is that influence? That influence is evil. And when I think of the wicked one here, I think of not Satan, but I think of evil, the, the presence of, of evil. And I do think of Satan because it's included. One more passage in Acts chapter 26. It says, and, we, and when we had all fallen to the ground, this is a recording of Paul's conversion, or at least of the uh, time that the Lord spoke to him. <clears throat> I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's, it is hard for you to kick against the goat. So I said, well, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which, have, which you have seen and the things which you will yet see or which I will yet reveal to you. I delivered you from the Jewish people, or I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of uh, sin. So Paul recognizes here that there's a close relationship between darkness and Satan from light or with light, the association between light and God. The darkness is associated with Satan. The light, of course, is associated with, with God. Going back to uh, Genesis and the people to whom Moses was speaking, um, he's writing, remember, uh, or in this time frame, the time that Moses actually lived, Moses didn't live at Genesis chapter 3. Moses is writing about Genesis chapter 3, but he didn't live this. He's being inspired to talk about it and tell these people at the foot of Mount Sinai, these Israelites who had escaped Egypt, he's talking to them. And these people had been 
under the power of darkness for four generations. They had been under the power of evil or the influence of evil for four generations. So in my understanding, in accordance with the promise that God made to Abraham, Israel, through Israel, Abraham's descendants, God is going to recreate or reestablish the kingdom of righteousness, which was lost at Eden. We lost it, humans did, in Genesis chapter 3. We'll discuss that when we get there. But in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, from day 6, the day that God created Adam, until whatever day it was or year it was that Genesis chapter 3 happened, the kingdom of righteousness was on earth. In Genesis chapter 3, the kingdom of righteousness disappeared, at least from earth. And so when God is speaking to, through Moses, these people at Mount Sinai, he's telling them, I'm going to use you, your nation, your people, your descendants, I'm going to use you to reestablish the kingdom of righteousness in the earth. If the kingdom of righteousness is not in the earth, the flood happens. And we'll talk about that again. Uh, that, that's when people are withdrawn from God and, the, and God has withdrawn himself from the world because it's evil. Corruption, absolute corruption is going to take place, right? Well, here, well, look at what Paul or Moses writes to them in the uh, Exodus. This is God speaking. Yet I have seen what I did, or you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You have seen how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So God is going to use these people as the ones who will, or through whom, he will bring in the kingdom of God back into the world. We lost it because of Adam and Eve. God's going to use the Jewish nation, the descendants of Abraham, to bring it back in, and he won't fulfill that until, or at least completely, until Christ comes some 2,000 years later than the book of Exodus. In the Bible, Egypt is a real place, obviously. But there are places in the Bible where Egypt is used, the term Egypt or the word or name Egypt is used symbolically to represent, I think, the kingdom of darkness, the power of evil. Instead of being just a place where Pharaoh reigns, the kingdom or the, Egypt is made synonymous with the kingdom of darkness. You got the kingdom of God, you got the kingdom of, of darkness, and Egypt is representative of that, at least in a symbolic sense. One author phrased it or called, said that Egypt is anti-kingdom. It's, it's the opposite of what God's kingdom is supposed to be. When you see how Egypt conducted itself, how it conducted business, how it conducted uh, itself with the people of God, the children of Abraham, we begin to see that Egypt is representative of the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of darkness. Uh, I wouldn't say that necessarily to an Egyptian unless I had um, a lot of time to talk to him to explain it because they'll think, well, that's, you're, you're dissing Egypt, not dissing Egypt or Egyptians. I'm saying that Satan's kingdom operates like Egypt at that time was operating. So God uses it, at least in some places, especially in the prophets, um, uses it, um, the term Egypt or the name Egypt as a, uh, in a symbolic way of represent, representing the kingdom of darkness. There's an author, Rob Bell, and I don't, he says a lot of things that I don't agree with, but on this subject, I think he did a great, great job. And I'm going to read to you from his book. It's called Jesus Wants to Save Christians. And for the most part, it's a really I think it's a really good book, um, but I don't recommend him as an author overall, or, or I don't 
put out a carte blanche recommendation of him because there's a lot of things he believes that just aren't in the Bible. But in any case, in this uh, book, he did a good job on, uh, on this. And I want to read it to you. Take a couple minutes. He says, in the Bible, Egypt is a place, a country, a nation where the story, speaking of the story of God or God's people, a place where the story begins. But he says it's much, much more to understand how central Egypt is to the flow of the biblical story. We have to go back to the introduction of the Bible to the Garden of Eden. We're told that Adam and Eve chose to go their own way, to explore outside of the boundaries given to them by their maker, and as a result, their relationship suffers. This story is immediately followed, the story of their fall, excuse me, is immediately followed by the story of their son, Cain, killing their other son, Abel. This is a rapid, dramatic progression from Adam and Eve to their sons. We have gone from eating fruit to murder in one generation and just one page in your Bible. Things are falling apart very quickly, he says. Not only that, he says, but right after the murder, a close descendant of Cain, his name is Lamech, we'll read about him in chapter four. Lamech, Lamech laments that if Cain's if, if Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech is avenged 77 times. The escalation of societal violence is so intense that a close relative of Cain says that things are 11 times worse than they were before, at least in Cain's time. And then by Genesis chapter 6, just two chapters after Cain and Abel, we find that the whole world is headed for destruction except for one man in his family, Noah and his family. And then in chapter 11, he says, we have people have, people have gotten together and they build this tower convinced that this will somehow make them gods. So we started with two people and some fruit and we've escalated to murder among family members to an entire civilization who is at odds with God. Bell writes, the story is a tragic progression. The broken, toxic nature at the heart of a few humans has now spread to the world. What started in the garden is now affecting the globe. The word for this, Bell says, is anti-kingdom, anti-kingdom. He says, there is God's kingdom, the peace, the shalom, the good that God intends for all things. And then there is what happens when entire societies and systems, empires become opposed to God's desires for the world. And he gives an illustration. He says, thinking back uh, at the time of when Moses was writing this and the people to whom he was originally writing, he says, imagine a Jewish slave girl living in Egypt, asking her father why he's got a bandage on his arm. Her father says, well, I was beaten today by my master. Well, why were you beaten by your master? He explains that quotas have been recently changed and he's now required to make the same amount of bricks as before, but he has to go and get his own straw. And he tells her that he's been falling behind in his brick production, and that's why he was beaten. And she asks, the girl does, why his master couldn't just let it slide? Why does he have to beat you? And he explains that if my quotas aren't met, then my master, his quotas won't be met, and he will be beaten by his master. And if his master doesn't make the quota, then he'll be beaten by his master or overseer. So it's a chain of command that goes all the way up to Pharaoh. And the father tries to make the daughter understand that, yes, the beating came from my master, but it's a part of a larger system, a complex web of power and violence and industry and technology that export, exploits people for its expansion and profit. That's what Egypt was doing. It was a 
exploiting a, a nation or a, a power that was exploiting these captive people for its own profit. I'll make you slaves, I'll beat you, you make my bricks so that I can build my whatever, temples, houses, or whatever. Bell says that the bandage on the farmer's or the father's arm is from a wound inflicted by one man, yet it's also from an entire system of injustice. The girl's family is facing an evil in the individual human heart that went unchecked until it gathered a head of steam and is now embedded in the fabric of that culture. What started in Eden with the eating of the fruit is now a superpower of Egypt that's taking advantage of lesser people. He says that's what anti-kingdom is. Egypt is anti-kingdom in the Bible perspective. Egypt is what, happened when, what happens when sin builds up ahead of steam. Egypt is what happens when sin becomes structured and embedded in society. Egypt is how easily human nature, or shows us how hu easily human nature bends toward using power to preserve privilege at the expense of the weak. Imagine this girl asking her father more questions. Questions not just about their life in Egypt, but about their history. Father, how did we get here, Egypt, in the first place? If we're Israelites, why aren't we living in Israel? And imagine this young slave girl being told that the Genesis story of how they became slaves. That's what Genesis is eventually going to tell us, right? If you know the book of Genesis, you've read it, I'm sure. Eventually, we're going to get to the point of how Israel became Israel, how it became a, a people or a tribe or a family, and then how they became slaves. Because the book of Exodus or Genesis ends with Israel going to Egypt in a peaceful way, but they're in Egypt. And then the book of Exodus shows that a time frame happened that change their being their own guest status to being their own, own slave status. The escalation of violence began with the first sons culminates in, in, in chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel. And when they're building the Tower of Babel, what are they building it with? Bricks. And so she sees this. Now, the girl is an imaginary girl, but she's real. There were people who were being told this. They understand. They're putting the pieces uh, together. These slaves in Egypt are being forced to make bricks all day long. They would understand the Tower of Babel story. They would probably say, we, we know what happens when people start building empires out of bricks. Exodus is about a people, a, a tribe, a nation that's being rescued from slavery. It's about being liberated from occupation. It's about the insurgent power of, of redemption from empire. God sends this shepherd Moses to lead them out of Egypt, and Moses challenges Pharaoh. They, they go back and forth over who is God exactly and why Pharaoh should even listen to uh, this God, and eventually the night comes when they gather up their possessions and leave Egypt. Three days later, the Israelites cross the sea and event, which is later referred to by Paul in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians as the baptism of Moses. And on the shore, they dance in celebration of their liberation. Makes a nice story, but it's not the end. It's only the beginning. Their journey takes them from the shore to the foot of a mountain called Sinai, and when they get to Sinai, something revolutionary takes place, not just for them, but for the whole story of the Bible and for all humanity. So with that background, and maybe I haven't done a good job of laying the foundation here, when you think of evil, from that context, what do you think of? I want you to see evil, Lawrence, I want you to see it as not just a word that describes bad deeds that people do. 
I want you to see that this is a real presence, an existence uh, in this world. I want to <clears throat> try to discuss with you an article that I read off a website called All About God. I was not able to ascertain the name of the author. And I'm not going to read the article, but we're going to talk about it. <clears throat> uh, I wasn't able to, I'm not able to give credit to the author because I don't know who it was. Uh, but from what I can tell, uh, he's very clear. And I think in accord with what the scriptures teach. The article is entitled, The Problem of Evil, The Philosophical Challenge. And it starts out like this. He says, the problem of evil is a philosophical stumbling block for many people. Empirical evidence for creation, and therefore a creator, is overwhelming. You and I, in our class, over the last few weeks, we looked at this video and we saw insurmountable evidence that the earth did not form itself, that it is the work of a designer, a superior being. Atheists have tried unsuccessfully to identify a, a mechanism by which the, the world could have created itself, but they're not able to do that. They're not able to come up with that. It's, it's a futile effort. But modern science continues to demonstrate to them that the world is not eternal. Matter is not eternal, and therefore the universe had to have a beginning. And scientists, they, they see that. They, they, they get that. The only feasible option then it, to explain the origin of the universe, space, time, matter, energy, natural law, is a transcendent creator. There's so much, and I don't want to go back into it a lot because we've discussed this thoroughly, I think, but there's so many examples that could be cited that um, reflect a designer. I think we talked about it, we introduced the thought last week, uh, I believe it was, about DNA. I don't know how much you know about DNA, but the design that's uh, there in that code, that DNA code is so complex. There's just no way possible, just no way possible that it could have happened as a cosmic accident or a natural accident and not only once but the billions and billions and billions of times that it happens in all life forms this complex code who wrote it who designed it if one remotely understands it's the complexity of biology and everything that surrounds dna a dna strand how can we possibly think that it's the result of chance or accident and it's not just the fact that it exists that's, that's amazing in enough of itself. But the code, the DNA code, has to be translated by the body in which it lives. In other words, it has to work the code. How does it do that? How does it know how to do that? There are billions and billions of code that have to code in the DNA strand that have to be uh, transcribed and interpreted by the body. How does your body know how to do that? A that was my phone, I'm sorry. A code without an interpreter or transmitter of that code is useless. So we have the code, which is a sign of design, and we also have the body's ability to interpret and translate that code. The guy brought it up in the uh, film. I just thought that you know, it, it's something to make. But my point is, an intelligent designer is the only reasonable conclusion that we can come to. So the point of the article is that intelligent atheists, knowing that 
the physical evidence says, yes, there has to be a designer. I don't want to admit it, but this could not just happen by chance. So they change their mode of attack. And I think we'll see this more and more as time goes on. I think people, scientists are more and more going to desert the evolutionary uh, paradigm because it just doesn't work. It can't work. So they, because they still don't want God, they won't allow, they're so blinded, they won't allow this evidence that their evolution can't be true. They won't allow that to change them. So they just change their attack to a uh, philosophical attack. And that's what I want us to, to look at. I don't want to confuse you with it. I just want you to be aware of it. One of the primary questions that philosophers ask or they pose is if God is real, and this takes us back to uh, Epicurus, if God is real, and this is the way the atheists are thinking, and that's the way that the question they're going to ask, and you, you and I need to be, be need to be prepared for it. If God is real, and if God created everything, why did God create evil? You get the question? I did. If God is real, and if he created everything, why did God create evil? They make some assumptions in the question, but still it's a question that they're going to ask and people are going to scratch their heads about it. And we're going to have to answer this question or be able to answer this question. To properly address the problem of evil, we need to consider the nature of God, the nature of man, the nature of love, and the nature of evil. Now, you know the answer to this question. You may not come up with it right off, but you know the answer to the question. What is the nature of God? Love. That's right. God is Love. First John chapter four, verse eight says, he who does not love does not know God because God is love. Verse 16, we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. That's who God is. That's what God is. That's the essence of God. He who abides in love abides in God, God in him. But believe it or not, and unfortunately it's the case, all, not all theists believe that God is love. Some people who claim to believe in God, a theist is a person who believes in God. Some people who claim to believe in God do not see God as a God of love. They see him as a God of war. They see him as a God of vengeance. Some see him as pagans see their own gods as a self-serving God. And love and self-serving are pitted against each other. God cannot be love and also be self-serving. So there are some theists who, who don't see that God is love. But I think for the most part, we can say that Christians would say, at least acknowledge it from the scriptures, that God is uh, love. They believe that God is a God of love. They may question it sometimes uh, in their lives, uh, but nevertheless, I think they would acknowledge that God is love because the scriptures teach it. We even have songs that say, God is love. So um, one could say that the fruit, the product that the Spirit of God produces in us, when we allow the Spirit of God to live in us, when we walk in the ways that God walks, or the Spirit of God's work, walk, God walks, it produces in us love. And love can be defined, as Paul does for us in Galatians chapter 5, as joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul describes love as being selfless. He says, love suffers long, is kind, 
does not envy, does not parade itself. Remember, God is love. So you can put the word God in there, right? God suffers long. God is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade itself or himself. It's not puffed up. Uh, it does not seek its own. God does, or love does not behave rudely, verse 5, and does not seek its own. In other words, it's not self-seeking. It's selfless. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. God is love. God is these things. And if we uh, are God's people, that's supposed to be descriptive of us too. So if love is what God is, if that's his nature, then God is all of these things to include he is selfless. And being selfless means he does what he does. He is what he is for the sake of others. And we have to keep that in mind. He's not, he doesn't do what he does in order to make himself rich, in order to make himself more powerful. That's what Egypt did, right? Egypt did the evil that it did to make itself rich, to make itself more powerful, whether you call it Egypt or Pharaoh or whatever, that's what they were, were doing. God does not do that. He does what he does for somebody else's benefit, not for his own. Accordingly, God has blessed us, and this is what you said earlier, with something called free will. We possess, it's our nature, part of our nature, that uh, we have free will. God has given that to us as a part of our human nature. Um, you can't say really that a dog has free will, right? He has instinct, but he's, uh, in the sense that he's able to make decisions uh, like we are able to make decisions, think things through, like we're able to make uh, think things through. A dog doesn't have that. The animal kingdom doesn't have that. We have something special, something different, something outside the animal kingdom. And that part of that anyway is the fact that we have free will. How do you define, Lawrence, free will? The ability to choose uh, which direction you take or what you choose to do is is of no uh, uh, consequence. It is of every consequence. consequence, but you, you, you can make the choice. Yes, you get to make the choice. And with that choice comes the either blessings or consequences of that choice. God told Isaiah, I think I'd have it here. Uh, yeah. God told Isaiah, they have chosen, speaking of Israel, they have chosen their own ways and their soul delighted in their abominations, but they did evil before my eyes and they chose that in which I delighted not. God gave mankind, God gave Lawrence, God gave Mike, God gave Israel, God gave Pharaoh, God gave humanity, Adam and Eve, that right. You can choose. We have the right to choose. It's a God-given right. It's part of our human nature, I think it's, uh, we could say. With choice comes the results of that choice. Whenever you make a choice, it always has results, good or bad, little or small, a little or big. There's always uh, results of the choice. And that result can be a consequence or it can be a blessing depending upon what choice you made. Uh, but the fact is we have choice. Did Adam and Eve have a choice? They did. Yeah. yeah. What were their options? To eat or not to eat. Well, they, they had several options, actually. There were, were more than one command that was given to them. God told them to dress and keep the garden. They could choose to do that or they could choose not to. 
They told, were told to be fruitful and multiply. They could choose to do that or choose not to. They were cho told, as you said, to not eat of the fr forbidden tree. They could choose to do that or they could choose not to do that. I believe that, and we'll discuss it more thoroughly later, Adam, there's an implied choice, and I don't know if it's so much implied as, I guess implied has to be the word. Uh, Adam had the choice to tend to his wife or not to tend to his wife. God presented Adam with a wife, and he had the responsibility to tend to her, to care for her, to guide her. She had the opportunity, the choice, to submit to him, to his leadership or not. She can choose to do it, she can choose not to do it. He can choose to take care of her, he can choose not to take care of her. There's no divine command yet written that he is to do that, but the implication is there. We'll talk about it uh, in a bit. Evil is described as sin. How does the Bible define sin? You've already mentioned this. Lawlessness. Lawlessness, that's right. Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. It's someone who operates outside the law that God has given. So sin or evil is anything, and it's what you said a while ago, it's anything that's contrary to God. God is love. His divine law is love, and anyone who operates outside of that law of love or outside of God is in sin. What did Jesus say was the essence of God's law? You're familiar with the passage. You may not think about it right now, but you're, you're familiar with it. Love the Lord your God with all, with all of your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and great commandment, first and great law. And the second law is like unto it. It's this, it has the same weight. There's a, one has to be first and one has to be second. The first one given was love the Lord your God. The second one given was love your neighbor as yourself. They're equivalent as far as the weight of the law. But the thing I want us to see here is that the law is, the essence of the law is, Love. God is love. God's law is love. When we op operate outside of God's law, we operate outside of love. It is the nature of evil, that which is contrary to God, to not love. Whether it's God or humanity, the nature of evil is opposed to God's law, is opposed to God. God is love. God's law is love. To not love God with your heart, soul, and mind, and strength is evil. It's put yourself under the presence, under the domain of evil. It is the nature of evil to selfishly do harm to that which God loves. You think about that definition. We know the nature of God is love. We know the nature of man, at least to in the context that we're speaking of, is he has freedom of choice to operate within the law of God or to operate without or outside the, the law of God. The nature of evil is to do harm to that which God loves. Evil can do that either in an active sense or an inactive sense. If I murder you, that's an active act of evil, operating outside the law of God's love. If you're starving to death and I have the wherewithal to help you and do not, that's me in an inactive sense. I just don't do anything. That too is evil. I am operating under the principles, under the domain of evil when I don't help my fellow man who needs help. 
it is the nature of love to do good for one's neighbor. And Jesus answers the question, who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Mankind? Yeah. Any man is, who, who is in need. You know, the Jews thought my neighbor is my fellow Jew who I like. Jesus says, no, your, your neighbor is someone who's in need, whoever he is. He is your, your neighbor. Love does not do harm to one's neighbor. He does good to one's neighbor. It is evil who does not do good to his neighbor. Maybe he does harm by hurting him physically. Maybe he does harm by not helping him physically. But in either case, it's the law or according to the law of evil or the nature of evil to not do good for your neighbor. And it's usually selfish when we do not. I murder someone because of some selfish need on my part. Maybe he was going to hurt me or steal my money, so I murder him in order to keep him from uh, doing that. Uh, maybe I don't feed the homeless or the poor man because, well, he's a Samaritan, or maybe because he's of this ethnicity or that ethnicity, or I don't know him, or it's going to cost me money if I do that. It's some selfish reason that causes me not to love, because if we operate under the nature of love, which is the nature of God, then we're going to operate selflessly. I'm going to do what's necessary to help that person, regardless of its how it may affect uh, me. Love, Paul says, does not do harm to one's neighbor. Listen to what he says in Romans 13. For the commandments, and he's referring to the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. Uh, if there's any other uh, commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not do harm to your neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And you do some study of Romans chapter 13, and you'll find a lot of things that we need to change about ourselves. This is the nature of love. This is not Mike saying it. This is not my sermon. This is Paul speaking. He says, love means you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You will not do harm to your neighbor. It's in that same context that Paul says, it's not your responsibility or right to take vengeance. That's God's. God takes vengeance because he knows everything. He knows all. It's, it's vengeance belongs to him. It's not does not belong to us. From our perspective, from our seat, love does no harm to his neighbor. And therefore, Paul says, love is the fulfillment of the law. The nature of love is to not just be good, but do good. It does not simply not do harm. It does good. So the nature of God is love. The nature of man is we have a free, a, a, a choice to walk within the nature of God or not. The nature of evil is selfless, to, or not selfless, but selfish. It does what it does for selfish gain, power, money, whatever it is that it's trying to gain. It does what it does for selfish gain. It will do harm to its neighbor for its own benefit. But love, the nature of love, it does not do harm. It does good. It does not take a... Uh, inactive role, it's active, it does things. Now here's the problem, going back to our topic, our subject of evil. Why did a personal loving God create a world in which evil, as we have defined it, this entity exists? 
Why did God give man freedom to commit evil? We have the freedom. It's our gift. Maybe right is not the right word, but it's our gift from God. We are blessed with the ability to choose in every situation, good or evil. Why did God give man the freedom to commit evil acts knowing that he would do that? The atheist reasons like this. Surely an all-knowing God of love would not allow evil to exist in his world. So because evil does exist in this world, either there is no God or he is not a God of love. So let's look further at the nature of God to see if it's appropriate for the atheist to lay this accusation at God's feet. When we think about this um, choice, uh, this ability to choose, from a logical perspective, how could God allow for love without the potential for evil? I want you to think about that question. It's not my question, it's the one, I, one of the, that I read in that article. He says, how could God allow for love without the potential for evil? Well, God could have created robots that do nothing more than forever say, I love you, I love you, I love you, and they do what they're programmed to do. They don't have any choice but to do what they're programmed uh, to do. He could have done that, but such a creature is not capable of love. He can say love. He can even do good things if he's programmed to do good things, but he's not programmed or he, he, he doesn't do those things because he's motivated by love. He does those things because he's programmed to do that. That's what a robot does. He does what he's programmed to do. God wasn't interested in programmed people. He wanted people with whom can, he can have a relationship. He cannot have a relationship with a robot, not a loving, a real, true, loving relationship with a robot because it's incapable of Love, logically speaking, in order for love, true, or I want to use the word real, real love to exist, then the opportunity for not expressing love must also exist. Does that make sense to you? In order for us to have the choice to love, we must also have the choice not to love. God gave us free will. He gave us that nature, and I think it speaks of a loving God. He wants us to love. You have the choice, but what he wants is that you will love, that you will make the right choice. Even though uh, he created us with that choice, even though the potential was, and in fact, the reality is that we would do differently, that we would not show love. The Bible says that God desires a real love relationship with his creation, specifically humanity. He's not looking for robots programmed to love without a choice. He says in 1 John 3, verse 18, my little children, let us love, or not love in word, neither in tongue, but what? in deed and in truth. That word truth comes from a Greek word which means not hidden. Love is not real unless one has the ability to not love. If one were able to choose not to love God, but instead chose to love God in visible, demonstrable ways, that would allow for a real love relationship with God. 
we, we speak of the word omniscience. We talked about a while ago, omnipotent, which means all power. Omniscience means all science or all knowledge. Is God omniscient? Does God have all knowledge? Yes. Yes. And God, because he has all knowledge, knew that if he gave the world, humanity, choice, there would be evil. To choose not to love is, by definition, evil. And he knew that there would be, since they had the choice, there would be some occasions, actually all occasions, not all occasions, all humanity would, at some point in their life, choose not to obey or to love. But if he doesn't give that choice, then there's no capacity for real love. So God creates humans with that ability, with that uh, blessing, the ability to choose. The philosopher Alvin Platinga, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, he says it this way, an all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing being could permit as much evil as he pleased without forfeiting his claim to be all-loving so long as for every evil state of affairs he permits there is an accompanying greater good. I guess what he's saying is that the potential for love outweighs the existence of evil. If God is love and in him is no darkness, then Unlike God, evil is not eternal. It cannot exist where God is. God is love, and in him is no darkness. There is no evil. So there is a place, a sphere, in which evil does not exist, and therefore evil is not eternal. It cannot be where God is. Evil is a side effect, um, a byproduct of the existence of, of love. You might, for me to use my free will blessing in a way that does not honor God produces evil. Love, God, provides free will. I get to make a choice. My ability to make a choice means that sometimes I will make the wrong choice. God's love gives me that ability to make that choice. But if I make the wrong choice, or when I make the wrong choice, suffering and death become a side effect of evil. Paul put it this way in Romans 5, Verse 12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. God says the side effect, the byproduct is only for a time. John says it this way, and the world passes away, the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God does what? He abides forever. Evil will end. There's going to be a time when there will be no evil. It's not because I don't really know how to explain it because I don't understand it fully myself beyond this life. Do we no longer have freedom of choice? And if we do, is there potential for us to be kicked out of heaven? I don't think there is potential for us to be kicked out of heaven. So does that mean we don't have the choice anymore or because our choice will always be right? Well, I can't answer that question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. What I know is evil exists. 
is it a creation of God? Well, only in the sense that in giving us the ability to choose to love or not. God created evil only in the sense that he gave us the ability to choose to love or not. If we choose not, then evil exists. Evil comes into existence. The consequence of poor choosing is evil, or the life or the existence of evil, and that will grow. Evil is not static or not uh, stagnant. It's going to grow. It's going to get worse. Who created it? Well, we did in that we chose not to love. God did in that he gave us the ability to choose not to love, but God didn't actually form evil and give it, an exist give it its existence. We did. He gave us free will and therefore the capability of doing evil. Um, the question is likely to come up, what about Satan? Um, it would seem that Satan, his angels, are or were created with the same ability to choose. There's nothing in the Bible, of which I'm aware anyway, that speaks of a redemptive plan for angels. God didn't have another son uh, that he gave for the salvation of or for the redemption of angels. The Bible does speak of a place of judgment and torment for the devil and his angels, but any further discussion, at least on my part, of the, the, the nature of Satan's fall and the ability of him to repent would be mere speculation because the Bible just doesn't go to it, go into it. It's not for us. It doesn't concern humans, and thus God reveals nothing to uh, us humans about it. Uh, so I couldn't and won't speculate any further about it because I just don't know. The Bible doesn't, uh, for lack of better words, it's none of my business. <laughs> Human and redemption, on the other hand, is the theme of the Bible. The Bible says that every man has exercised the ability to sin, to choose wrong. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God obviously did not eliminate our ability to sin. God's nature is love, but the Bible also says that God's na nature is just. He is just. Justice requires payment for sin. God allowed sin in that he gave us free will. While divine justice, according to the Bible, requires payment for sin, Divine mercy, sacrificial mercy, tempers God's judgment by providing redemption from that sin that God sacrificed. In showing us love at the cross, God demonstrated again that he is love. One author said it was not nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was love. John writes in 1 John chapter 4, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that he might live, or we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Why did a God of love allow evil? because he's a God of real love. He didn't make robots. He made people with the ability to choose. He wants us to choose to love. When we fail in that, he provides us an opportunity to return to that. Evil is the result of using free will 
to disobey God, to turn away from God. And as we looked at some of the scriptures earlier, it's not static. Evil is not. Once its presence has come, it, it has influence. It gets worse. It gets worse. It gets worse. As we will see in the continuing narrative of Genesis and the Bible, evil not only grows, it grows quickly. Satan, you know what, there was a song, or maybe it was just a, a saying, I don't remember. The devil made me do it, remember that? Flip Wilson, I believe his name was, that made it popular. The devil made me do it. Well, the devil didn't make you do it. He can entice you to use your freedom of choice, your free will in that way, but he can't make you do it. That's a choice you have to make, a choice to love God or a choice to selfishly love yourself. All right, let's take a break. I just wanted to spend some time doing that tonight. I don't know if it was helpful or not, but I wanted us to see um, the nature of evil, where it came from, how it came to be. Did God create evil? And the answer to the question is yes and no. No, he did not create evil as a presence, but he did give you the ability to bring it into existence by giving you free choice. But he gave you free choice as an act of love. And he gave you the ability to use it for that purpose. Let's take a break and we'll come back and uh, begin again. All right. All right. It's uh, eight o'clock. Let's come back at uh, what? Eight ten. Is that okay? Sounds good. All right. Wow. Hey, Vincent, I didn't see you there. I didn't know you were in the room. Yes, sir. I came in about 6.33, 6.34. Okay. Uh, I only had one picture up there, and it was uh, Lawrence, so I didn't know you were in the room. That's okay. <laughs> Glad to have you. Yes, sir.
Okay, guys, are you back? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Well, we finally make it to the text. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. What does that mean to you? Said it was empty. Empty, void, without form. I mean, it's, 
the uh, in the film that we watched, they, one guy said it, it was a water ball, just a big muddy water ball without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The word deep there typically refers to water. And the um, spirit of God was hovering, fluttering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. The book that one, one of the books I had you order was by Alter, the uh, book of Genesis by Alter. And what he does, it's a commentary, I suppose, but more valuable than the commentary, I thought, were some of the uh, translations that he gives of, of the word. It's his own translation. And his translation of the first verse is, when God began to create heaven and earth, the earth was water and waste and darkness over the deep and God's breath hovering, the word breath there is the word spirit, hovering over the waters, God said, let there be light and there was uh, light. These are uh, probably some of the most famous words in the Bible, famous because they're the first words of the Bible and people when they open up the book, that's the first thing they read. There are other verses that are as famous, the 23rd Psalm, John 3, 16, maybe a few others, Jesus wept, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that are famous as well. But these are some of the most famous words in the Bible. It was said that Moses, by inspiration, is the master wordsmith choosing his words with precision. He didn't just throw words out there like a newspaper columnist who's just trying to fill up space. These, each and every word, was chosen for a reason, and it's a precise definition or description of uh, what happened. In the first verse, he mentions God, which is only appropriate that God is mentioned in the first opening statement of God's book, and he uses the Hebrew word Elohim. The word E-L, or the letters E-L, refer to God and the Ohim part of it uh, indicates a plurality. In the Hebrew, if we were reading it as the Hebrews read it, in the beginning gods, more than one, created the heavens and the earth. Well, that might be confusing to someone who says, well, there's only one God. Well, there is only one God, only one nature of, of God, but we know from this very context that there is a being referred to as the Spirit of God, and then there's God himself. Later on in Genesis chapter uh, 2, we find these gods, these Elohim, those who make up the Elohim, the nature of God, speaking to themselves. Let us make man in our image. So there's a plurality. We don't know really how many the plurality is until we get into the New Testament and we find out this teaching about, or we find the teaching, it's not really a doctrine, but it is mentioned that there is a uh, threefold nature. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We won't get into that. But the word Elohim, it's uh, the word or the name of God or the name for God or the description of God that tells us who he is. It's not just a plurality of of gods that's indicated there. It's, it's a supreme God, a, uh, uh, a word that speaks of his uh, sovereignty. He's the true God, mentioned over 2,000 times in the Old Testament. The word Elohim is also used in the Bible to describe false gods. Dagon of the Pharisees, not Pharisees, the uh, Philistines, was referred to as Elohim. Uh, Baal or Baal in 1 Kings 18 24, the term Elohim is used to describe him. So it's, it's a word that refers to our God, but it's also in a generic sense a word that is used to describe false gods or gods that aren't gods at all. There is a personal name for God, and you're familiar with it, but I want to bring it up here found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, the, this is the history of the heavens and the earth. 
when the, they were created in the day that the Lord God, the word God there is again the word Elohim, but the word Lord, and you'll notice it in your Bibles, it's capitalized, all four letters. It's, a, uh, it's the word Yahweh in the Hebrew. That's not exactly how they would pronounce it, but it's close enough that we, we can understand it. So Moses uses two names or words in the first uh, two chapters to refer to God. Elohim in chapter 1 and Yahweh in chapter 2. And he does that in a reason. He didn't write uh, chapters and verses, but there's a natural division between chapter 1 and chapter 2. And part of that division is seen in the way that he refers to God. He refers to God in chapter 1 as Elohim, the sovereign God, the true God, the, the one God, the real big God who is able to create from nothing. He says something and boom, it happens. That's Elohim. That's who he is. That's what Elohim is. He's the one who can speak and bring into existence. So who is Yahweh? It's the same God, yes, but he, Moses, why does he choose a different term in chapter 2 to refer to Yahweh? or refer to him as Yahweh. Any ideas? He calls him Elohim in chapter 1. He calls him Yahweh in chapter 2. Why the distinction, if there is any distinction at all, any reason? Because when man makes his uh, choice, there will be a distinction between gods. Okay. Well, man won't make that choice till chapter three. So here in chapters one and two, we're seeing we're, we're seeing Elohim, the creating God, the powerful God, the the one God, the uh, sovereign God, and then Yahweh. Who is that God? It's the same God, but what is Moses trying to tell us when he's changes words. He changes from the powerful created or creating uh, I speak and it happens God to Yahweh. What's the difference in those two terms? Why does Moses change gears? In chapter one, Moses is trying to demonstrate something very powerful. This, remember who he's writing to, to the Jews, who had just escaped from uh, captivity. This is the God who saved you. He can speak and it happens. This is the powerful God. He is sovereign. He is, there's nothing outside of God's control. He can take chaos and bring from it life. He created the chaos and he used the chaos to bring life. No other God can do this. No God can do this. There are no gods that can do this. And we'll see how that's particularly important in, in just a moment as we begin to see what the Israelites thought about gods in general while they were in Egypt. But then he changes from, in chapter 2, from that powerful demonstration or, uh, of who God is. He is the Elohim. He is the creator, the, the sovereign ruler of the universe because he created the universe to chapter two, a very soft name, personal name for God, Yahweh. It, it demonstrates God wants to have a relationship with humanity. It's in chapter two that, you know, in chapter one, man is created, but in chapter two, uh, Moses goes into a more detailed account of God actually using his, his hands, so to speak, uh, to bring into existence uh, humanity. Um, Dagon and the other gods of the Old Testament uh, times may carry the name Elohim by their followers. They call him, they call Dagon Elohim, but he's not. 
Please understand that. The Bible uses that term toward them accommodatively. That's what they called him. That's what the Philistines would have called him. But God would not call him Elohim because he is not. Dagon is a stone, a rock. God is the only one who bears this name. And the um, um, confrontation between Elijah and uh, the followers of Baal in uh, there on Mount Carmel, Elijah proved. These, this God, Baal, he can do nothing. He, he can't do anything. You can chant, you can call out to him, you can cut yourself, you can dance all day long, but he's not going to do anything. Only God, only the true Elohim can cause the fire to come down from heaven and light that sacrifice there in Mount Carmel. Anyway, Moses wants his readers, the readers of Genesis 1, to see, to envision the creator God as the powerful God, grander than all of our imaginations combined. He is the powerful Elohim. They had just seen these Israelites, Elohim and his power over the Elohim of Egypt. They would have called the Egyptian gods Elohim not in the Egyptian language, but in the Hebrew language. If they were to call him anything, that's what they would have called him, most likely because that's the generic term for God. But Moses is showing in Genesis chapter 1, this is the true Elohim, the one whose power who brought you out of Egypt, who destroyed all those non-God gods and split the Red Sea. That is Elohim. You've not seen any of the gods of Egypt, the Elohim of Egypt, so to speak, do something like that. You want to know who God is? He's the one who just brought you out of Egypt, and he's the one who, in the beginning, created the heavens and the earth from nothing. It's at Moses' intent to exalt God, lift him up, and for them to see how great he is. He is the one without beginning, without origin, unbound by time or space. He was in the beginning. When the beginning started, God already was. The Egyptians didn't think of their gods as eternal. They believed, and we'll get into it more in a minute, um, that their gods were uh, formed by the chaos. The Egyptian cosmology and the Hebrew cosmology, they have some similarities. They're very, very different, but they have some similarities. I believe Egyptians stealing from the cosmology of, of the, the true cosmology anyway. Um, and that's why there are some similarities. There's chaos in both of the stories. There's chaos in God's story in the beginning. Um, God created the heavens and the earth, the earth, and the earth was without form. The earth was void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That's chaos. God created the chaos, and from that chaos which he created, he calls life to come. God can do that because he's Elohim. But the Egyptian mythologies say that their gods were created by the chaos. The chaos was actually in the beginning. And their gods came from that. And Moses, at the very start, he says, I want you to understand something. What you've been taught about gods in Egypt for the last 400 years, it's not true. That's not right. Let me show you. The God who just did that, the God who just divided the Red Sea and destroyed all of that, he is the Elohim, and he was in the beginning. Before chaos, he was in the beginning. You get the idea? That Moses is trying to help us understand the sovereignty, the majesty of God. In uh, antiquity, people use their different mythologies to explain how uh, the world functioned. We do it today. We don't call it uh, mythology. We call it science. We look to science and develop our worldview, at least to some degree, from science. And we base our worldview 
upon how we look at uh, science and the evolutionary paradigm will do it. People who will, who follow that have a completely different worldview than people who follow the creation paradigm. If you asked an Egyptian or a Canaanite, where does rain come from? The response would have been uh, not a science lecture about rain, but a, a tale about how the rain god brought rain into existence. Since we use this word, the dawn of time, every society has had its own cosmology. How do you define that word? Either one of you. How do you define cosmology? What is cosmology? The word, uh, it's a Greek origin. Uh, you see that word C-O-S-M-O? -O? Cosmo? Yes. It's not talking about the guy on Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the word Greek word cosmos and the word ology or logi at the end of it. It means the study of uh, Psychology is the study of psychos, not really, uh, but the idea is there. Uh, biology is the study of bios. Um, you get the idea. Uh, cosmology is the study of the cosmos. The cosmos is the world. And the idea is where did the world come from? Every society has had their own story, every culture, Every uh, tribe, you might say, has had their own cosmology of where, a creation story of where things came from. Cosmology is a creation story. It's the explaining in that person's or that culture's um, way of thinking where the earth came from, where, what were the earth's uh, origin. And we, we do it, you, know, you, you hear people say, where did I come from? How is the world created? Where are things going? It's the study of cosmology, where the people understand that that's what it is that they're saying or not. That's what it is. We all ask those questions. Egypt had a cosmology. They had a system of paganism, very complicated or complex system. I wish I had the opportunity to to go over that with you, and I'm not going to because it's not part of our purpose. But they had a very complex theology, paganology, um, that uh, explained their creation story or gave their creation uh, story. One of our, our current system of uh, humanism is, it comes from a, a broken system of evolution, but it, it in their minds explains where we came from. We think we are above God. We are above his judgments that there is no God. So humans are the top of the line. They're, we're at the top of the food chain, so to speak. And that cosmology does away with God. Well, Israel, while they were in Egypt, was exposed to the influence of Egypt's, whatever their cosmology was, Whatever their study of origins stated, Egypt, or I'm sorry, Israel was influenced by that. Moses would have been aware of what uh, Egypt taught. He would have been aware, more aware than most probably because he was raised in the house of Pharaoh, right? He was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, and she would have trained him in the ways of the Egyptians. He would have gone to all the Egyptian schools, and they would have taught him the Egyptian cosmology, the Egyptian pagan system, which involves their uh, cosmology. So he was familiar with it. He knew what they uh, taught. I don't know how much Moses was taught by his mom. He was raised by his mom in Pharaoh's house. So did he come home from school? And she said, well, I know what you've done at school today, but let me tell you the truth. 
I don't know how much of that happened. I wasn't there. Um, Moses, it seems to me, came of knowledge of, at some point that the Hebrew people were his people. Uh, so he knew something, but I don't know how much and when he knew that. But here in our text, whatever was his knowledge gained from the schools of Pharaoh or the schools of the Egyptians, whatever was his knowledge, God inspires him to write something different. You tell them, Moses, I am Yahweh, or not I'm Yahweh, I am Elohim. There is only one Elohim. I was in the beginning. I created all things. I created the chaos, and from the chaos I created. According to the Egyptians, there were no gods in the beginning. There was just the chaos. I, they would use the same terminology, I guess, that evolutionists use today, that primordial bowl of soup, of cosmic bowl of soup, the waters from which everything came. We have in our cosmology, in the beginning, God. They have in their cosmology, in the beginning, chaos. One author writes, one Egyptian creation account says that the god amun Re emerged from these waters and created the lesser deities of the pantheon through sneezing and masturbation. Well, I tried to do some research on that to see exactly what that was about. And that's actually true that uh, I don't know if sneezing was the right word, but at any rate, they believe that Amun-Ra uh, came from the chaos, the waters of chaos somehow, was created by that, and then he himself created other gods through these other means. There are a lot of myths and a lot of cults that would have been spreading around or spread around during the time that Israel was in Egypt. And that's why Moses writes these words. Keep in mind who he's writing to, why he's writing, and that's why he writes the words that he does. He tells them in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth were without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. He tells them all of those things because they were taught something different. And he's saying, you know the God that just, or you know that somebody just divided that Red Sea. You know that somebody just destroyed all those gods. This is the one. And so he gives them definition to who was um, that God. They, the Egyptians believe that all life came from Nu, in you, which was what they called the chaos or the waters of chaos. Uh, all life came from this non-being. I don't know how they would describe that or why they would believe it, but they did. The Egyptian stories also include a pyramid-shaped mound, which came from those waters. And that's why they worship the pyramid or use the pyramid like they do. Think about, for a moment, the land of Egypt as you know it. How it's basically, you know where Egypt is? On yes, sir. It's right there at the north uh, east part of uh, Africa, of the continent of Africa. It's a desert. <laughs> Not much more to say about Egypt than it's just a big desert with the Nile River running through it. And you think about that concept, a desert with the Nile running through it. And this is how the gods formed Egypt. Look with me at Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. It says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put a man, the man whom he had formed, out of the ground, the Lord made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted into four 
riverheads. Not Egypt was a desert with a river running through it. Eden, the Garden of Eden, was a, a garden, a garden, not a desert, but a garden with a river running through it. And that river nourished every, everything so that everything good for sight or pleasant for sight and good for food grew. The river was basically a river of life, you might say. The New Testament makes a spiritual, that very spiritual application of it. The Egyptian, seems to me, the Egyptian cosmology stole the idea about the river and applied it to Egypt and the Nile, which they said were from the beginning. And if you watch or read the Bible about the Nile, uh, you'll learn that the Nile floods. Uh, I forget what time of year, I guess spring. The Nile uh, floods for six months out of the year and it nourishes the earth that it's flooding, makes it uh, fertile. When the river recedes, when it goes back into its banks, the Egyptians are able to produce almost anything that can grow, will grow there in the Nile River uh, Delta. That's how it came to be that they worshipped the Nile. The Nile was the God who gave produce. Can you see how that did that? How that happened? How that happened? They see that the Nile produces, or by the natural way it does things, it causes things to to grow, and therefore this must be God. So they made a whole theology about that. This is how life came to be, as far as they understood it. The sun was also closely associated with creationism in the Egyptian cosmology. It was said to have first uh, arisen from a pyramid. The sun came from a pyramid. His name was Ra, the sun god Ra. There's a lot of different versions uh, Egypt was a big country, and so they had different places that had different versions of the uh, creation story. Some said it came up as a, a bug, a beetle. Some say it came out of a lotus flower. Some say it came out of a pyramid. Some say it came up as a, as a, uh, in the form of a child. Dep depends on where you lived in Egypt as to what the cosmology was, but it all boiled down basically to the same uh, thing. There are several different cities in Egypt uh, Hermopolis, uh, Heliopolis, Heliopolis, Memphis, uh, Thebes, and depending on which city you were in is the cosmology you would get as far as the various uh, versions of it. But what I want you to see is that um, Israel, living there for 400 years, the people would have been influenced by what they were told about the beginnings. And so Moses has to correct that view. As we continue to read, we'll find that Israel is also influenced by Mesopotamian cosmology. Where is Mesopotamia? You got Egypt over here in the uh, African continent. Mesopotamia, if you go north and east from Africa or from Egypt over to where what we would think of as uh, Persia or Babylon, Nineveh, you know, you're familiar with those names. In that area, uh, Mesopotamia means between the rivers. Mesopotamia means in the middle of rivers. The two rivers that the land was between was the Tigris and the Euphrates. That's why it's called Mesopotamia because it's between the two rivers. But anyway, in Mesopotamia, they had a different cosmology, a different uh, belief than Egypt did. And who was um, Israel's ancestors? The Israel that was in Egypt, who were their ancestors? That was the tribe of Judah. Well, Judah, and go back before that, you got um, Joseph. Uh, well, Joseph would have been the brother of, of Judah, but you got Jacob who gave birth to the, or no, he didn't give birth, but he had 12 boys. Uh, and then you had Isaac, and then you had Abraham. Where did Abraham come from? Uh, 
We'll read about it in Genesis chapter 11 and 12. But where did he come from? Abram was from? I want to say Eden. Say it again? I want to say Enon, but I, I know that's not right. No, he was from Ur. Ur. Ur of the Chaldee. The Chaldee. Where are the Chaldee? Well, that's where Babylon would eventually become, and that's Mesopotamia. So Abraham came from Mesopotamia or Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. And the land between the rivers had their own cosmology. And as we read through Genesis, we'll find that the Israelites that were in Egypt, while they were being influenced by Egyptian cosmology, they brought with them the cosmology that they had from their father Abraham, or from Abraham's granddaughters, actually. Uh, if you will read about Rachel, who had her gods, and Jacob's uh, other wives who had their gods, they stole their father's idols. We'll read about that in Genesis chapter 31. They had their beliefs that these gods, whatever they were, teraphim they're called, uh, is the word for, for their gods anyway, for, for the idols anyway. <clears throat> they, they had certain beliefs about their, those gods that would have been their origin beliefs, their cosmological uh, beliefs, and they would have passed that down to their children. They did give up the idols because they had to, but the mentality was still there. So Abraham's children, Abraham himself was affected by it. He was called by Joshua uh, an idolater. He was called out of idolatry. And his, because they came out of that culture, it would have been in their minds and it would have to, have to be filtered out eventually, but it's still there for a while. And according to Mesopotamian uh, theologies or cosmology, their creation story, it involved a pantheon of gods that were fighting for the top spot. And Marduk or Marduk finally won the top spot and he used, according to uh, what they've written, he used the, the body of his enemy to create the existing heavens and the earth. So in the beginning, Marduk created the heavens and the earth from the gods that he defeated. That's their cosmology. It's not how it's worded, but it's basically the idea. Moses wants them to understand. I want you to forget that. Forget what you learned from your forefathers back in Mesopotamia. Forget what Israel or Egypt has taught you for the last 400 years. I want you to see that in the beginning, Elohim, Elohim created everything from nothing. They needed a correct creation account. And that's what Moses is doing. We'll also find not so much in Genesis, but it's important to remember that Israel was influenced by Canaanite uh, cosmology. Uh, Abraham left Ur the Chaldee. He came into Canaan, and God was going to give Canaan to Abraham's uh, family. And there's a reason why God was going to take it from the Canaanite. It's because the Canaanite cosmologies were so vile and vulgar that they were destroying the land. So God says, I'm going to take it away from you. And I'm going to give it to Abraham. And it would be 400 years before that would take place. And there's reasons uh, for that. But you got all these cosmologies. You got Canaan, um, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. Their creation stories and the stories of their gods would have at least been in the ears of Israel. And so that's why Moses starts out like he does. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The world in Moses' day... Uh, believe that the world in which they lived, they existed, was a playground for various uh, deities. 
not speaking specifically of the Israelites, but not leaving them out of it. They were a highly superstitious people. Um, and some of those superstitions have lasted even to present day. For example, if I were to say, how many lives does a cat have? What would you say? People would say nine. Yeah, nine lives. Where does that come from? It comes from ancient Egypt. They actually believe that. That's why they worshiped the cat. Where does the idea of eye makeup come? The, 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 the eye makeup that your wife uses. Is that me or you? Um, the eye makeup that your wife uses, where does that come from? Well, it comes from ancient paganism in Egypt and the worship of the cat. The eye makeup um, that they use to make themselves look like cats. If you look at those pictures in the uh, hieroglyphics, the women and the men wore makeup and it gave them cat-like eyes. And it was because of their worship of the cat. So even makeup that people use today comes from that. It, it says we don't use it in a uh, pagan sense uh, like they did or a superstitious sense, but that's where it came from. If you see a ladder leaned up against the wall, what are you going to do? Walk around it. You're going to walk around it. You're not going to walk under it. Why? Where does that come from? Let me read something to you. Th kind of interesting, I think. Ladders are one of the most used tools since early times for man. The superstition around ladders claims that if you walk under the ladder, one will deem themselves to misfortunes and bad luck. The history of this superstition goes way back to ancient Egypt, where priests, listen to this, priests would place ladders in the tombs of the dead so that the dead could ascend upward out of their tombs if they chose to do so. It is believed that spirits collected in the space that formed under the ladder. You think about a ladder leaned up against the wall, and you got this space under the ladder, and spirits would gather there, deciding whether or not to ascend the ladder, but that's where they uh, would form. What is the shape? that's formed, if you have a ladder up against the wall, what is the shape that's formed? It's a triangle. You got this angle, and you got this angle, and you got the floor. You've got a triangle, which would be in the shape of a pyramid. You get it? See how it's all connecting? Yes. When a ladder leans against the wall, it forms a natural triangle, and that particular geometric shape has been regarded as sacred since the most ancient of times. And since it is a, it is a region to be venerated, it would also be a space to be avoided. It's, they venerate it, they lift it up as a holy space because that's where the spirits gather. But also it would be a place to be avoided because you don't want to go where the spirits are. So the idea or the concept that it's, Bad luck to walk under a ladder comes from ancient Egypt paganism. I thought that was highly interesting. What about the number 13? What do you know about that? Unlucky number. Unlucky number comes from Egyptian paganism. And the main thing I want you to see here is if we're influenced 5,000 years later, how influenced would those children of Israel have been in the day? The number 13, uh, life is, according to Egyptian theology, life is a series of 12 steps towards spiritual enhancement. The 13th is the afterlife. For them, that was a, a good thing. When you make it to the 13th, you've made it. That's good. 13 is a good thing. But over the centuries, uh, a fear of the number 13, maybe it's because of death, the association with death. You can't get to number 13 until you die. Uh, whatever it was, the number 13 became, rather than be revered, it became uh, feared. And that's how we get the unlucky uh, 13. So my main point in bringing all those things up is for us to understand if we are 
influenced little or big by these things. Think about the people who actually lived when those things were thriving. That's the people to whom Moses is writing. And that's why he says to them, all that stuff that you heard is bunk. It's garbage. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was without form. It was without void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and God brought from it life. This is the God who just split the Red Sea. This is the God who just trounced upon the deities that your culture has been worshiping. All right. Um, I'm not going to be able to go any further than that um, tonight. So we get two verses done, right? Genesis 1 and 2. That's good. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we'll start at Genesis chapter uh, 1, verse 3, and we'll go into uh, chapter uh, 2. We'll quit a little bit early tonight because I don't want to get started in it and then have to just uh, stop immediately. Um, I know we've done, covered a lot of thick material uh, tonight. The where does evil come from? It's never an easy discussion. And I hope I didn't confuse you more than I helped you, but evil comes from what? Help me understand that. From choice. Choice. You having the right to choose. God gave you that choice. God gave you that right to choose, but it's we who make the choice. And if we make the wrong choice, the unloving choice, the selfish choice, we create evil, the presence of evil in our lives. And it has significant consequences and it has unending consequences as long as this world exists. But once this world is ceased from existing, the New Testament teaches us, there will only be there, there will be no presence of evil in heaven. Um, the main thing I wanted to do is address the uh, idea that God created evil. And I, I suppose there is a sense in which you could say that's true, but with the intent that those who make that accusation say it's not true. Uh, God, uh, according to Epicurus, uh, if he created evil, he's not God. If he can't control evil, he's not God. If he doesn't control evil, if he has the power but does not do so, he's not God. Well, God is in control. And we'll see that throughout the Bible. We'll see that in, in Genesis. Uh, Genesis 1 But did God create evil in the sense of let there be light, let the earth bring forth grass, let there, did he create evil in that sense? No, I don't think he did. Well, I know he didn't. But he created it or allowed it in the sense that he gave us choice, the ability to choose. So I spent a lot of time to say that tonight, and I hope um, the effort wasn't in vain, and I hope the effort wasn't more confusing than it was uh, helpful. Um, when we look at Genesis chapters, or chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, I want you to see who is Elohim. He is the one who is in control. He is the one who is uh, creator. They needed to see it from their perspective. We need to see it from ours as well. Any questions or comments? No. When you have a um, system of religion wherein the gods don't care about humans, and that's the Egyptian thinking, the gods were concerned about the gods. Humans were an afterthought. And I think that's true of the Canaanite gods and the Mesopotamian gods. When the deities themselves 
haven't got any regard for human life. It's just they use humans for their pleasure. They use humans for self, selfish concerns. If that's how the gods use humans, how will humans who believe that treat other humans? The same way. The same way. Yeah, no compassion. That's exactly right. The genocide, the racism, and all the violence that comes from the world today is from a godless people or from a people who don't understand God. Guys, when we get to Genesis chapter, the last part of chapter one, first part of chapter two, when it says we were created in the image of God, we need to understand what that means. We were created to be the image bearers of God. As image bearers of God, if God is love, we must what? Love. Mm -hmm. That's who we are. We must allow God to transform our minds, our spirits, our beings with his word, with his spirit, so that we have his spirit and we are people of love. That's the only way we're going to make an impact on this world. We can't have a 100% good impact on this world because not everyone, there are people in the world who love darkness. That's why Jesus was crucified. Part of the reason why Jesus was crucified. Um, we need to see who God is. We need to be his image bearers. You guys have a good night and I will see you next week. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you.